Welcome back to Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes, and this is part two of BTK. I always recommend going back and listening to part one first, especially if you're unfamiliar with this case. Before I recap, I just wanted to say that Mindhunter is in fact a Netflix series, not a documentary. I don't know why I said that in my previous episode, and of course I didn't catch it during editing. It does feature real-life cases, and the main idea of detectives creating profiles for serial killers is accurate, but it is dramatized, not a documentary. Having said that, definitely worth watching. So now that I've cleared that up, let's recap part one. Dennis Rader developed strong sexual fantasies of bondage and autoerotic asphyxiation. At first, he acted out his fantasies solo. He took photos of himself tied up, wearing a painted mask. Then he'd use them as masturbation material while he tied ropes around his arms and neck. But soon he had a desire to bind, torture, and kill, hence the name BTK. He stalked Julia Otero and planned to sneak into her home after the rest of her family left for the day. It wasn't part of his original plan, or project as he calls it, but Julie's husband Joe and children Josephine and Joey were also home that day. The Otero family became the first four victims of Dennis Rader. We left off discussing Dennis writing into his journal like a teenage girl. He writes mainly about his sexual fantasies and urges, as well as the evil alter ego he refers to as the Minotaur. So there's Dennis Rader, president of the church council and Cub Scout leader, and the Minotaur, a sadistic murderer. One passage included his admiration to H.H. H. Holmes and his murder castle, which, if you need reference, go back and listen to Killer Stories Episode 8. Dennis went on and on in detail about how he wants to find an abandoned silo and make it into a place to torture and murder his victims. Luckily, these remain just fantasies. Dennis had what he called a hidey hole, a place he kept trophies he took from the Otero home and newspaper articles about the murder. At first, his hidey hole was outside in his shed, but then he decided it would be safer to keep them at his parents' house a place he would still frequent to act out his quote-unquote big-time bondage when his parents were out of town. Just like Dennis did with Jolie Otero, in April of 1974, he spots another woman who strikes his fancy and stalks her, 21-year-old Catherine Bright. He calls his next plan Project Lights Out. He parked his car on campus where he attended Wichita State and walked a few blocks down to Catherine's rental home. He then sneaks in through the back door. He found her bedroom and patiently waited for her return. This is another daytime break-in. Just one reason why, day or night, I keep my doors locked. Serial killer Richard Chase said he only entered homes with unlocked doors. He took that as an invitation. After I heard that, my doors were locked 24-7. But we'll save his story for another episode. Around 2 p.m., Dennis hears the front door open. Once again, things are not going as planned. Catherine is not alone. Her younger brother, 19-year-old Kevin, is with her. Dennis panics and jumps out from the bedroom yelling, Hold it right there. Catherine and Kevin look over to see a man pointing a gun at them. He pulls the same BS story about being on the run and needing food and money. At gunpoint, he forced them back to the bedroom. Catherine was the first to be bound. Kevin was actually the one to tie her up while Dennis held a gun to his head. As he did this, Dennis turned up music full blast to drown out any loud sounds coming from the home. Then, he takes Kevin to the spare bedroom where he uses Catherine's scarves and nylon pantyhose to tie him up. Apparently, Dennis's hit kit was lacking enough cord for the both of them. You would think after his last set of murders, he would be a little more prepared. Well, Kevin isn't going down easy. He loosens the bindings and attacks Dennis. 
Kevin comes close to getting the gun away from him, but a full-on brawl ensues. Dennis pulls the trigger and hits Kevin in the face, but Kevin continues to fight back. Dennis shoots a second time and hits him in the mouth. At this point, Kevin decides to play dead. He's badly hurt, and if he were to get up, I doubt he would survive a third shot. Dennis thinks that Kevin is dead, or at least will be soon, so he walks over to attend to Catherine. When he tries to strangle her, she fights for her life. Dennis isn't able to keep a tight grip around her neck and abandons his initial plan of strangulation. And that's his fascination, bondage and asphyxiation, the whole point of his projects. But he's panicking. Nothing is going as planned. He decides to grab the knife from his hit kit and stab Catherine repeatedly in the abdomen. In later interviews, Dennis stated that stabbing was a lot messier than he had expected, and he was now completely covered in blood. Catherine was actually still alive when Dennis decided to run for it. He was in such a hurry that the gray hat he was wearing was left behind in the house. He noticed that the front door was open and saw Kevin running down the streets. He had escaped. On his way out the front, Dennis cut his leg on some glass and was bleeding. He had grabbed a set of keys from the table and tried to steal Kevin's truck that was parked out front. But he grabbed Catherine's car keys, not Kevin's truck keys. So, a blood-spattered Dennis ran the few blocks to where his car was parked on campus, sped home, and cleaned up before Paula returned home from work. Dennis wrote in his journal that he would never stab to kill again. He lost control at Catherine's house, and Project Lights Out did not go as he had imagined. When Kevin escaped, he ran to call for help. When police and EMS arrived, Catherine was still alive. She was having trouble breathing because Dennis had punctured her lungs. She was only able to tell them someone had broken in and she'd been stabbed before she passed out. Catherine was taken to a hospital where she underwent surgery and multiple blood transfusions. She unfortunately didn't make it and became the fifth victim of Dennis Rader. Detectives found the gray hat left at the crime scene, as well as traces of blood that did not belong to Kevin or Catherine. Two of Kevin's teeth were on the floor in the spare bedroom. The second shot hit his teeth and thankfully did not penetrate the skull. Kevin gave the police a description of Dennis. White male, seemed in his mid-twenties, about 5'11", stocky, he had dark hair and a mustache. Even with his hat and blood left at the scene and the description of the perpetrator, the case went unsolved. In October of 1974, Dennis heard that they had suspects for the Otero murders. He was angry that someone else was going to get credit for his work. He wrote a note and left it inside of an engineering book at the public library. He made an anonymous call to the Wichita Eagle newspaper and told them where they could find the note. The editor reported the phone call to the police. The note read, quote, I write this letter to you for the sake of the taxpayer as well as your time. Those three dude you have in custody are just talking to get publicity for the Otero murders. They know nothing at all. I did it by myself and no one's help. There has been no talk either. Let's put it straight. He then describes each of the Otero family members, what they were wearing, where they were found in the house, and how he killed them. The note goes on and on and honestly makes little sense. It's signed, Yours Truly Guiltily. P.S. Since sex criminals do not change their M.O. or by nature cannot do so, I will not change mine. The code words for me will be, Bind them, torture them, kill them. B.T.K. You see, be at it again. They will be on the next victim. Unquote. I mentioned before that Dennis struggled with spelling and writing. The letter was full of grammatical errors. It's honestly hard to even read. This was the first communication from the killer to the media and police. 
but this information wasn't released to the public quite yet. In 1975, Dennis landed a steady job with ADT Security. He worked his way up to installation supervisor, so he would be able to troll for victims while he worked. The ironic thing was that a lot of people were getting security systems trying to prevent their home from being broken into by the killer. Little did they know, he was the one inside their home doing the installation. After the murder of Catherine Bright, the Minotaur took nearly a three-year hiatus. It wasn't until March 17, 1977, that he killed again. Project Green, I guess because it was St. Patrick's Day, was different from his other projects because it was totally random. He had a potential victim picked out, a woman named Cynthia. Dennis had parked at a local grocery store and spotted Cynthia's house in a neighborhood across the street. He walked over and knocked on the door, but she wasn't home. He was so hyped up, he needed to kill now. He just went down the line knocking on doors. The unlucky soul to open the door would be his next target. He knocked on quite a few unanswered doors when he saw a little boy walking down the street. He showed him a photo and asked him if he could identify the person. He said no, sir, and kept walking further down the street to his house. So Dennis follows behind him and, after a few minutes, knocks on the front door of the home that the boy just entered. A woman answers, Shirley V. Ann. Dennis claimed he was a detective and showed her the same photo, asking if she could help identify the person. As he was talking with her, he slowly enters the home and shuts the door behind him, pulling a gun on her. He explained that he had a problem with sexual fantasies and needed to act on them. He took the little boy and his siblings to a bedroom and began tying them up. When they started to cry, he knew that would be distracting for him, so him and Shirley moved them to a bathroom. She was trying to cooperate with him for the sake of her children. Dennis tried to make them comfortable, as comfortable as you can be tied to a chair, He put toys and stuffed animals in the bathroom with them. Then he locked and tied the door shut. And to be sure they wouldn't escape, he then pushed a bed against the door. Shirley feels ill over the situation and vomits. Dennis gets her a glass of water and attempts to calm her down. When she's feeling better, he ties her to the foot of the bed, binds her hands and feet, places a plastic bag over her head, and strangles her to death with a cord. Notice how he calls these sexual fantasies, yet there is no sex involved. It's the act of bind, torture, kill that gets him off. So he self-gratifies and has a sparky big time, leaving evidence of such into a pair of Shirley's underwear. When he's finished, he can hear the kids banging against the door and screaming from the bathroom. Just then, the phone rings. Dennis grabs his hit kit and exits the home, walking across the street to his car parked at the grocery store and drives off. The kids eventually untie themselves and exit the bathroom through the window. They ran to the neighbor's house and called 911. Dennis later confessed in a letter to police that he had planned to kill the children as well. He wanted to suffocate the two boys and hang the girl. But when the phone rang, it startled him and he decided to get out of there. Thank God. When Dennis returned home, he writes a poem. Shirley locks, Shirley locks, wilt thou be mine? Thou shalt not scream not yet feel the line, but lay on a cushion and think of me in death, and now it is going to be. December of 1977 would be the next time Dennis, I mean the Minotaur, struck. He had been stalking a woman named Nancy Fox for some time now. She had multiple jobs. He knew she was working her night job on the evening of December 8th. Apparently, he couldn't decide on a project name for Nancy. He called it Project Fox Hunt or Foxtail, sometimes just PJ Fox. PJ is short for project. 
He cut her phone line and broke into her duplex from a bedroom window. When she came home, he confronted her in her kitchen. At gunpoint, Dennis told Nancy he had a sexual issue and was going to tie her up and rape her. I don't know why he felt the need to tell these women about his sexual issues and lie saying he planned to rape them. Rape is not part of what he does. Later, after his capture, he explained that he didn't want to cheat on his wife, and that's why he never raped anyone. Dennis, I hate to break it to you, but if your wife finds out you're a serial killer, she isn't going to be like, well, at least he didn't cheat on me. That's probably the least of her worries. Perhaps he told them he was going to rape them because it's better than being told you're about to be murdered? Who knows? Nancy did not resist. He allowed her to sit on the couch and smoke a cigarette first. Then she says, quote, let's get this over with so I can call the police, unquote. She was taken to her bedroom where he tied her up and strangled her with a belt. Dennis once again left evidence of a sparky big time behind, this time into a nightgown of Nancy's. He took Nancy's ID and some of her belongings to add to his hidey hole. Then he turned up the heat to speed the process of decomposition, throwing off the determined time of death. He did this same thing with the Otero murders. The next morning, Dennis watched the news but didn't see anything reported about Nancy. So he dialed 911 from a phone booth. He said there had been a homicide, Nancy Fox, and gave the address. Then he walked away and left the phone hanging off the receiver. Which was pretty stupid because then the call was able to be traced. The recording of the 911 call played all over the news. No one recognized Dennis as the caller, not even his wife. In 1978, Dennis decided to communicate with the media again. He mailed in the Shirley Locks poem to the Wichita Eagle, but it didn't get the attention he wanted. They were confused and did not put two and two together that the poem was from BTK and was referring to Shirley Vianne. So, a few days later, he sent another note. He confessed to killing Shirley Vianne, Nancy Fox, and another woman he left unnamed. We now know he is referring to Catherine Bright. He also attached another poem titled, O Death to Nancy. Ready? (laughs) What is that I can see? Cold, icy hands taking hold of me. For death has come, you all can see. Hell has opened its gates to trick me. O death, O death, can't you spare me over for another year? I'll stuff your jaws till you can't talk. I'll bind your legs till you can't walk. I'll tie your hands till you can't make a stand. And finally, I'll close your eyes so you can't see me. I'll bring sexual death unto you for me. BTK. In case the citizens of Wichita hadn't figured it out yet, they had a serial killer. The police made a public announcement warning people to be extra cautious and keep their doors locked at all times. In April of 1979, Dennis broke into the home of 63-year-old Anna Williams. He had been stalking her home, and from what I've read, his actual target was her granddaughter. Once he broke in, he waited for hours. Dennis became frustrated and decided to leave. He took a few items from her home as trophies, a scarf and some jewelry. When Anna returned home, she realized that her phone lines had been cut. Two months later, Anna received a package in the mail. She opened it and was startled to find some of her own belongings. There were also two papers in the package. One was a drawing depicting what he had planned to do that night, and the other was a poem. Oh, Anna, why didn't you appear? "'Twas the perfect plan of deviant pleasure so bold on that spring night, my inner feeling hot with propension of new awakening season, worn wet with inner fear and rapture, my pleasure of entanglement, like new vines at night, 
Oh, Anna, why didn't you appear? Drop of fear, fresh spring rain would roll down from your nakedness to scent of lofty fever that burns within. In that small world of longing, fear, rapture, and desperation, the game we play fall on devil's ears. Fantasy spring forth, mounts, to storm fury, then winter calm at the end. Oh, Anna, why didn't you appear? Alone now in another time span, I lay with sweet and rapture garments. Across most private thought, bed of spring moist grass clean before the sun, enslaved with control warm and wind scented the air, sunlight sparkled tears and eyes so deep and clear. Alone again, I trod in past memory of mirrors and ponder why for number eight was not. Oh, Anna, why didn't you appear? <laughs> Can you even imagine? Realizing two months after the fact that a serial killer was in your home waiting for you. Anna Williams was beyond horrified at the discovery and did not waste any time leaving Wichita, Kansas. I'm not sure if you're keeping track, but we have now discussed seven BTK victims, which means there are still three to cover, not to mention more letters from BTK to the media and his capture. So I'll be back next week to wrap things up. If you're enjoying killer stories, there are a few ways that you can help support the show. First, you can leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. You can visit buymeacoffee.com slash killer stories to make a one-time donation. It's set up in increments of $5 as if you're buying me a congratulatory beer. Cheers. And finally is the merch store. I have tanks, tees, hoodies, stickers, mugs, and my newest item, a face mask. As for now, masks aren't going anywhere, so you might as well do it in killer style. You can find the website for shopping, as well as the source material for today's episode, and my social media links, all on my link tree in the show notes. Follow me on Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram at Killer Stories Podcast. Twitter is at Killer Stories PC. I have all of my episodes now streaming on my YouTube channel, Killer Stories Podcast. One final shout out. Holly of Ivy Nicks Photography for an amazing photo shoot back in October and designing my new podcast cover photo, which is so badass. Follow her on Instagram. It's Ivy Nicks, I-V-Y-N-I-X underscore photography to see more of her work. She specializes in cosplay and adds some really cool special effects with her photographs. As always, thanks for listening. Until next time, this has been a killer story. <laughs>